Good afternoon. Welcome to our 150th annual meeting. Not all organizations uh, get to reach such an important milestone. So we're here together to savor the moment. And to all our members here and watching remotely, we're glad you're with us. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher. And I'd like to acknowledge um, some people in the audience today, directors and trustees in attendance today, um, General Pace, who's our foundation chair, um, Bob Work, who's our chair of the board, Admiral John Greenard, former CNO, Admiral Harry Harris, Admiral Scott Swift, Marine Major General Charlie Bolden, Bill Hannigan, Mel Immergood, Greg Glaros. Uh, we, we really appreciate the fact that they give their precious time. I also acknowledge uh, former directors in the audience here today. We've got John Morton and Coast Guard Vice Admiral Sally Bryce O'Hara. And I think I also spied Dan Bowler in the audience. Dan, welcome. Um, in addition, we're lucky to have some active duty flags here. I won't recognize anybody, but there's everybody because we get, uh, we get too long. But I wanted to mention uh, Marine Lieutenant General Chris Mahoney, who's here with us tonight, um, and Vice Admiral Yancey Lindsay, Rear Admiral Randy Kreitz, Vice Admiral John Mustin, Vice Admiral Craig Clapperton, and uh, Vice Admiral Sean Buck, Superintendent of the Academy. If I left somebody out, I apologize. So before we get too far along, I'm now going to ask you to stand back up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We thank our sponsor, L3 Harris, for helping make this event possible. And we thank Rear Admiral Matt Gucci Clunder, who's representing L3 Harris here today. Thank you. In the early twilight of 9 October 1873, a group of naval officers ranging in rank from lieutenant to Rear Admiral assembled in one of the U.S. Naval Academy's academic calls to organize a Society of Officers of the Navy for the purpose of discussing matters of professional interest. And they chose the name United States Naval Institute. Many of these men had known the dangers of the sea and the violence of the enemy. Now armed with quills rather than swords, they were exhibiting a different kind of courage risking not their lives, but their livelihoods, as they prepared to battle the complacency and the chaotic circumstances of the Navy in 1873. Here, 150 years later, I'm happy to report that the state of the Institute is strong. Our nonpartisan open forum of Proceedings Magazine is thriving. We're publishing the important American Sea Power series, and we've expanded the size of each issue to take a trip back in history for every month in our 150th year. Our Naval Institute Press is publishing great new books and embarking on a very exciting digital project, a digital textbook project. Our conferences and events have emerged from COVID stronger. We're reaching more people with hybrid events. And those who thought that in-person events were dead, were dead wrong. Our new conference center is ahead of plan for bookings, and we've expanded our offerings and improved our reach and impact across the board. Our bottom line was below target in 2022 due to market losses for investments. I don't know about you and your 401k, but I experienced market losses as well. So I'm happy to report that despite that, our balance sheet here at the beginning of 2023 is the strongest we've had in the 12 years that I've been here. Our success is based upon a staff of dedicated professionals who are true believers. And I ask the members of the Naval Institute staff who are here today to stand up and be recognized. So 
So, we have an impressive board of directors, and again, I thank them for their support and for giving us their most precious asset, their time. Our Constitution and bylaws requires that we announce the election results at the annual meeting. We have re-elected Admiral Thad Allen, Major General Charlie Bolden, Admiral John Greenert, Admiral Bill Moran, and Admiral Scott Swift. Those are re-elected. And looking at the chart, we welcome Lieutenant Commander Michelle Foster, U.S. Coast Guard, who serves on the board ex officio as the chairman of our editorial board. We also welcome Lieutenant Troy Thompson, who's the junior active duty voice on the board, who's appointed, not elected, but we've started to do this a few years ago, and it's been really, really positive. As far as board liaisons go, we have three active duty flag officers who serve as liaisons to the board. They're not voting members, but we sure appreciate the fact that they're swimming in the same pool as the active duty group, and they're very important contributors to our board meetings. And we welcome Brigadier General Marcus Annabelle, USMC, and Rear Admiral Joanne Burdian, U.S. Coast Guard, this year as, as liaisons. We say thank you to Lieutenant Salam Keiko, who was the previous junior voice on the board. Um, he also serves on the Ed Board. And the liaisons who departed because they got other assignments are Brigadier General Dave Odom, USMC, and Rear Admiral Scott Clendenin, U.S. Coast Guard. Okay, editorial board. For editorial board, the new members are, and this again, elected in this ballot for 2023, is Captain Sharif Kalfi, U.S. Navy, Sergeant Major Jack Reif, U.S. Marine Corps, Commander Stiles Hurt, U.S. Navy, who's an FEF, Lieutenant Commander Steve Hults, U.S. Coast Guard, Federal Executive Fellow, and again, Lieutenant Troy Thompson, who serves on both. And we thank our departing Ed Board members, Tyson, Tyson Metters, Lieutenant Commander Tyson Metters, and Lieutenant Salam Keiko. So, the Foundation Trustees. We have a terrific Naval Institute group of Foundation Trustees for volunteering. We appreciate the fact that they volunteer their time, as we said, and have provided steadfast support to the Institute. They always have our back, no matter what is thrown at us. And special thanks go to General Pete Pace for his leadership during an extraordinary and impactful period in the Naval Institute Foundation and, indeed, the Naval Institute's history. So, we have one housekeeping item uh, before we uh, continue, which is that if you want to ask questions after our speakers, including myself, uh, we'll do Q&A. And uh, if you're in the audience here present, we have mics down here at the bottom of each of the center aisles, and you can use those. And if you're at home, you just tune in virtually and submit by emailing to annualmeeting at usni.org. So please state your name when you come down. We want to know who you are, and please ask a question. So, so for the Naval, the Naval Historical Foundation, this, is a, this was a big deal last year. Uh, the Naval Historical Foundation has a proud history. Founded in 1926 with support from the Naval Institute, it ended operations as a separate entity late last year. Uh, Todd Creekman was kind enough to locate the original check from 1926, where on 13 April 1926, uh, we founded the Naval Historical Foundation. And uh, it's great that he, uh, he tracked this down. He brought it over the other day. It's very cool. And there's a quote in this framed check that he gave me from a 1947 proceedings article by Dudley Knox. And Dudley Knox's quote was, it might fairly be said that the Naval Historical Foundation was mothered by necessity and fathered by the U.S. Naval Institute. So welcome back. We welcome back home all the Naval Historical Foundation members who are now members back with us. 
and we fulfilled their memberships with uh, Navy Naval History Magazine. Um, we also look forward to continuing key recognition events that were conducted by the Naval Historical Foundation, uh, including the Dudley Knox Award rec for Recognition of Lifetime Achievement. And we're happy to report that the history-focused essay contest that the NHF was doing with the Naval Academy is now part of the CNO Naval History Essay Contest. We've created a new category for midshipmen and cadets, and that's everybody included, Naval Academy, NROTC, the Maritime Academies, Coast Guard Academy, et cetera. So we thank you, Jennifer London, for supporting that. For 125 years, the Naval Institute Press has published a wide range of books dedicated to the history of the sea services. From our first book, Log, Log of the Gloucester, 1898. And by the way, Harry Harris found us a pristine copy of that book just in the last few months. Thank you, Harry. The latest book is Brent Sadler's U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century that was published just this week. We've evolved over the decades, and now with an eye on the future, we'll continue to focus on our strengths, the development of the digital project that I've already mentioned, which will really transform the way we deliver our content, especially to our educational partners. Promoting naval history and participating in debates about current naval affairs are not the only missions of the press, and publications and books dedicated to the sea services have been the pillar from its inception. We just published the 26th edition of the Blue Jackets Manual, which we've published continuously since 1902. In addition to these and other professional books, we provide textbooks that are used in NROTC and NJROTC, and we've also embarked on an updated edition, finally, of the U.S. Naval Institute's Guide to Ships and Aircraft of the U.S. Navy. The American Sea Power Project, now in its third year, continues to produce foundational articles, new thinking on the ends, ways, and means of sea power. In the past year, articles have moved from the strategic ends of strategy to the ways such as innovation, cyber operations, intellectual readiness, and culture. Retired Navy Captain Jeff Klein's article in the April issue starts the conversation about the means of strategy and the force that is required, the force structure that is required by the strategy. The American Sea Power Project seeks to influence the upcoming Congressional Commission on the Future of the Navy that was kicked off by the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act. Like most member organizations, the Naval Institute has been challenged to maintain our membership numbers. However, unlike most membership organizations in our marketplace, our market space, our reach and readership continue to grow. We're proud to say that our combined web traffic across all our sites combined was 33 million page views in 2022. In terms of demographics, both in age and geography, our readership is very healthy. We're reaching readers across all age groups and right at the height of people's professional careers. Think about 03s, 04s, up to 06s, warrants, LDOs, and senior enlisted professionals. We're in, we're in the spot for them. Most of our readers are in North America, makes sense, but we have a pretty strong, pretty strong following in Asia and Europe. On the 10th anniversary of USNI News, USNI News is now the undisputed, trusted journal of record for the flag wardroom and for the people on the Hill. In 2022, USNI News hit a new record for traffic with 23 million page views, which was a 7% increase over 2021, which was also a record. USNI News reporters and freelancers were underway on more than a dozen U.S. and international ships last year. And USNI News has also expanded the coverage of the shipbuilding industrial base and visited nearly every new construction naval shipyard in the U.S. over the past year, including a big golf swing in August of last year. Our stories have set the stage in Congress 
in the ongoing debate over the Navy shipbuilding program. In addition, we've expanded our daily coverage of Chinese operations in the Western Pacific. And building on that effort, USNI is embarking on an ambitious project to provide more coverage on the rise of the People's Liberation Army Navy and the PLAN's impact on its neighbors and the rest of the world. Ten years in, USNI News has succeeded in giving Naval Institute members, the Navy, and the public an unbiased, fact-based news source that they can trust in the maritime realm. With over 600,000 followers on Facebook and 170,000 followers on Twitter, the Naval Institute has the largest social media presence among all professional military membership organizations. The Naval Institute continues to grow its social media presence at an accelerated rate, and we've really made some big gains. Um, for instance, from this time last year to now, uh, we've increased our Twitter followers by 57%. REACH indicates the total numbers of unique people who, the Naval, who see Naval Institute content in whatever they're reading on social media. And again, from 2022 to 2023, our social media reached a global audience of 281 million people. So we're followed by hundreds of reporters from major news outlets, resulting in USNI posts frequently being cited as a source in the press. DOD commands follow and engage on our social media, which raises our profile within that key community. The average engagement rates, which measure how frequently people comment or share our social media, are 0.06% for Twitter and 0.27% for Facebook. Those are the averages. Anything over 1% is considered good, but our Naval Institute engagement rate is close to 4%, for Twitter and 7% for Facebook, which means that the audience is finding our content compelling. Impressions measure the total audience of all stories that are citing the Naval Institute. In addition to citing our content as a source, um, our contributors to USNI, our contributors from USNI uh, provide insight and analysis on request. In 2008, the Naval Institute as a whole, and again, Impressions has a limitation. It's good for trend, not good for a point measurement, but for trend, if you go back to 2008, we had six million impressions from all our products uh, with the Naval Institute. And today, we have nine billion impressions. So we're, we're doing more in a day than we used to do in a year. So that's a good trend. So far, We've been cited by outlets that you see here. Uh, you can see them yourself. But every time we appear there, we get impression credit. The, the broad exposure helps us achieve our mission to advance the understanding of sea power and other issues critical to global security. So we just had the coronation in the UK, but the sun does not set on the Naval Institute. <laughs> Naval Institute's grown into being a global source of sources, and hundreds of international outlets cite us in dozens of languages while linking our content, and even more people discover us in that manner. There aren't many organizations that get to celebrate their 150th, as we said at the beginning, especially in the nonprofit world, and the U.S. Naval Institute counts itself among a lucky few. The Naval Institute foundation provides 40% of the resources that underpin every aspect of the Institute. The other 60% we earned out. But the foundation supports proceedings, naval history, the press, USNI News, our oral histories, and our other naval heritage initiatives, including digitizing all our content. In this 150th year, we have a unique opportunity to build the resiliency of this historic organization and ensure it not only survives, but it thrives for another 150 years to underpin our crucial mission work. Throughout 2023, we hope you'll consider joining us by making a gift for the celebration. We also hope you'll mark your calendars for the Institute's sesquicentennial celebration, which will take place on 9 October 2023 
which is the exact date of our founding. The event will take place right here in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. It's going to be the Institute's first ticketed event. It promises to be fun, unique, and memorable. And we're offering a variety of sponsorship opportunities for those who wish to support the 150th and set conditions for our future success. Having the Conference Center allows us to play both home and away games. We continued the Warfighter series we created for the midshipmen. We bring 400 plebes here for special fleet warfighter events. We'll hold the 2023 History Conference here on 25 October, which will address critical thinking, our greatest weapon to winning tomorrow's war. We will discuss creating an educational culture in the military focused on critical thinking. We believe strongly that the next war will be won by the one who outthinks the opponent. West 2023 was terrific. We had over 9,200 attendees pick up their badges over a three-day conference. Uh, during West in February, we held our eighth DARE Innovation Workshop. This annual two-day workshop convenes a diverse group of approximately 65 junior officers, enlisted leaders, and high-performing young civilian counterparts. Each year, DARE tackles questions posed by one of the three service chiefs, and this year, they responded to questions from CNO Mike Gilday on topics of force design and attracting and retaining talent. CNO personally took the debrief direct from the participants. He spent over an hour engaging and asking questions and was generally impressed and intrigued by some of the creative solutions presented by the participants. He was so impressed that he asked for a video after we didn't tape it. He asked for a video, so we redid it. And uh, he's considering showing that at uh, a future flag and SES event. DARE gives a voice to young leaders to address challenges and brief those results direct to the top. 2022 was our first full year of operations for the Jackson Taylor Conference Center. And the Naval Institute's doing exactly what we set out to do. We built a, a physical space that enhances our power to convene. We hosted several of our own professional conferences and events, um, our annual meeting, two maritime security dialogue events, the CNO Naval History Essay Contest recognition event, our, Naval, our history conference, six warfighter events, and the three Naval Institute Press author events. In addition to our own Naval Institute events, we surpassed our goals for bookings from external groups, and we're on pace to do the same this year in 2023. We think we're attracting the right level of clients. The majority of the event space inquiries are from military, government, or professional companies and organizations. We're not doing bar mitzvahs and weddings. We're doing <laughs> military, government, and professional events. Uh, when we're building a base of repeat clients, also of note, the conference center was designed and built to be certified to hold classified events. And we are certified to hold discussions up to top secret, sensitive, compartmented information on a temporary secure working area per use waiver basis. And the word's getting out. We've successfully held classified events. And one of the ones I want to note here on the bottom left side here, the Commandant of the Marine Corps had his executive offsite meeting here with all his three stars and four stars, and they used classified. So we've, um, we've, we've met another milestone in that regard. So this concludes my CEO update. So now I will invite Captain Bill Hamblett, U.S. Navy retired, who's our wonderful editor-in-chief of Proceedings Magazine to the stage, to kick off our author award presentations. Bill, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very it's pleased uh, to announce a number of it's award fine. winners today, starting with winners of three essay contests. The Naval Institute has been running essay contests since 1879. We currently have about 12 contests annually, and a great deal of proceedings content comes from our essay contest because not only do we publish the top three winners of each contest, but we evaluate every entry 
for a publication, even if it doesn't win a prize. All our essay contests are judged in the blind. We don't know who the authors are until the screening and judging is done. And we like it that way. May the best ideas and the best writing win. The first winners to be recognized today are from the Midshipmen and Cadets Essay Contest, which is open to anyone in a commissioning program in the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, or Merchant Marine. So service academies, NROTC units, officer candidate schools included. This year's third prize winner is Midshipman Second Class Jack Montgomery, U.S. Navy Reserve, from the NROTC unit at the College of the Holy Cross. His article is titled, Build Missiles Now, and it evokes lessons from the ongoing war in the Ukraine and will remind people of David Allman's general prize winning essay contest, essay from last year. It will be published in an upcoming issue of Proceedings probably this summer. Please welcome Midshipman Montgomery to the stage. Thank uh, you. My interest in the Navy's missile procurement uh, be, uh, was because of what I thought was a misguided conversation about what the Navy was missing. While politicians and proceedings contributors were debating over how exactly to ensure enough missile cells are in the right theater at the right time, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was demonstrating that having enough missiles to fire at the enemy was a far more pressing issue in a high-end conventional combat environment. For example, in just one day, the Russians fired as many strike missiles as we procured in a year. That's why I argue that the Navy's current missile procurement plans need to be altered in order to get the necessary amount of missiles in American arsenals prior to a major naval air, combat, uh, naval air conflict and to increase the capabilities of the manufacturing base to produce these high-end missiles in quantity during wartime. With the publication of this essay, I hope that the Navy will substantially increase the quantity of their multi-year missile procurement requests to ensure a large arsenal and a strong manufacturing base. Thank you. This year's second prize winner is Ensign Mark Colvin, U.S. Coast Guard. He was a cadet when he wrote the article titled Paratus. It looks at the Coast Guard's readiness for its DOD wartime missions and will be published this summer. Please welcome Ensign Colvin to the stage. Thank you. I've been uh, <coughs> reading proceedings since I was about eight years old, so I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, <laughs> so I'll keep it short and concise, as you probably don't need to hear all that much from a five-month ensign. Um, <laughs> I wrote the article Paratus to point out the Coast Guard's declining interest in and ability to effectively execute one of its core missions, defense readiness, and to point out the unique opportunity that the Coast Guard has to augment the Navy's littoral mission gap with specialized capability, authority, and experience. Lord Nelson frequently complained that he never had enough frigates, and the Coast Guard has frigates. They just need to be better armed. Right now, those frigates are liabilities during war, and they could be assets. Um, so when I joined the Coast Guard, I joined to make a difference, serve my country, and it's my hope that I can do so by writing, by clearly articulating ideas on paper, so that it gets to those who can make a difference. The further the Coast Guard strays from the military, the less relevant it becomes. Thank you very much for your opportunity to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This year's first prize winner is Midshipman Second Class Quentin Zimmer, U.S. Navy, from the U.S. Naval Academy. Midshipman Zimmer's article, Flexible Frigates, the FFG-7's Lessons for the Constellation Class, will be in the June proceedings, which we're putting to bed this week. When you read it, you will be impressed it was written by a midshipman and not someone of much higher rank. Please welcome Midshipman Zimmer.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Midshipman Sutton, Class of Zimmer. Um, glad to be here. Yeah, thank you for the remarks, sir. Uh, I'd like to start off with a few thank yous. My parents traveled a little ways to be here today, and also uh, Midshipman Sutton, Class Miranda Bly. Uh, also to two individuals from the Naval Academy's History Department, Commander B.J. Armstrong and Lieutenant Commander Chris Costello. Uh, they really helped me better refine, make sense of, and present my, present my ideas in a written format. I'd also like to thank the Naval Institute for giving me this opportunity. So when I began to think about writing the article, I really wanted to explore what modern surface warfare would look like in an era of peer competition. The common narrative pitched to my generation of warfighters is that early action in the Pacific will be dominated by submarines and stand-in force marine units. So how, in a time and place threatened by long-range hypersonic missiles, an opponent with home field advantage, and the erosion of assured USC control, will the surface warfare community be able to help contribute to the fight? The coming of the new Constellation class frigates inspired me to connect our past in the form of the Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates with our future and distributed maritime operations in the face of mounting anti-access air denial threats. My hope for the article is that the ideas about the Constellation class with its multi-mission flexibility as its strength will help spur the thinking of operational commanders and my peers in the next generation of naval officers to not make the same mistakes of our past while thinking creatively about how to succeed in the future, whether protecting convoys, securing global connections, or maintaining sea control in a hostile environment. Thank you. So that's exactly why we started this contest about four years ago. And if you um, are one of the older people, grayer people like me in the audience who sometimes is concerned about the future, I think those three people just gave you a lot of confidence. Uh, the second group of contest winners we're recognizing today are the winners of the Information Warfare, Information Warfare Essay Contest, sponsored by Booz Allen Hamilton. All three essays will be in the June issue of Proceedings, and they all add significant, important new ideas to the ongoing discussion about naval information warfare. The third prize winner is Lieutenant Commander Greg Porter, U.S. Navy. His article is titled, Run Silent, Not Deep and provides lessons from the submarine force for today's surface and aviation fleets operating in contested environments. Unfortunately, Greg was not able to attend, but let's give him a round of applause. The second prize winner is Lieutenant Commander Eric Seligman, U.S. Navy Reserve. His article is titled, Changing the Cyber Warfare Leadership Paradigm and it draws lessons from naval aviation and naval special warfare that can be applied to the information warfare community. Please welcome Lieutenant Commander Seligman to the stage. So uh, as any good award acceptance speech should, I want to begin by thanking those who granted me the support and opportunity to pursue my writing goals, uh, to include my wonderful wife, Sherry, my beautiful children, Vivian and Everly, uh, my parents, colleagues in both the military and private sector, and of course, the USNI, for without them, none of us would be here today. In the months since I wrote my essay on cyber warfare leadership, the landscape of Navy cyber has shifted dramatically. With congressional motivation, the Navy is now in the process of adopting a cyber warfare operations designator and a related training pipeline. This is indeed cause for celebration. It is my sincere hope that the Navy and indeed the other services use this opportunity to take a long look at what it means to lead those who have chosen cyber warfare as their profession. As others have said, leadership in this field cannot be dragged and dropped. It must be grown organically, if possible. If one thing can be taken away from my writings, I hope it is the observation that cyber warfare leaders must have what I call combat experience. They must know what it's like to enumerate devices, understand the complexities of interrelated network systems, and have felt both the anxiety and excitement of launching an exploit against an adversary target. It is my contention that once a leader knows what cyber warfare feels like at the keyboard level, only then can they fully appreciate the complexities of operating in this domain. Only then can they anticipate the far-reaching effects of success or failure, and only then are they prepared to lead cyber warriors of both today and tomorrow. In my essay, I speak to not only the need for ground-level experience, but also the necessity of insularity, not of ideas, but of experience. 
or just as in our aviation and special operations communities, experience in cyber warfare is costly and hard to come by and must be shared sparingly with intention. Lastly, I would state that the new direction we are now taking as a service is a uh, first step in a long road that I believe will help lead us to dominance in the fifth domain of warfare. As such, I hope those of you who read my essay now see it not just as a call for radical course correction, but as an affirmation of the path we as a service have now started down. Thank you for your time, and thank you for this award. The first prize winner in the Information Warfare Contest is Lieutenant Commander Adam Riefen, U.S. Navy. His article is Navy Information Warfare Needs Requirements Officers, and it addresses the needs of having properly trained and experienced requirements officers in the information warfare community. Commander Riefen was not able to attend in person, but we have his recorded remarks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Commander Adam Riefen, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak at such a momentous event. Congratulations to the leaders and members of the United States Naval Institute on 150 years of fostering dialogue, debate, and ideas about our sea services. It's truly an honor to be even a small part of such a big celebration, and I wish I could be there with you. I'm grateful to those same leaders and members of USNI for sponsoring the Information Warfare Essay Contest. My entry was born out of a tour on the OPNAV N2N6 staff, during which I was introduced to a new skill set, requirements management. During that tour, I learned a lot about how the Navy and the Department of Defense determines what it needs, requests resources, and then generates the personnel, platforms, and capabilities that comprise our fleet. I wanted my essay to encapsulate the key elements of those lessons, particularly where they apply to information warfare. I hope to make a case for why IW officers should seek out jobs in requirement man requirements management and what both the community and those individuals stood to gain by building a more robust cadre of requirements officers. But more than anything, I wanted new IW officers arriving at OPNAV to have a quick and digestible introduction to their new jobs, something I wish I'd had before I set foot in the Pentagon. It's not often a turnover guide winds up in proceedings, but if it inspires a wider understanding and debate, so much the better. If writing is organized thinking, then writing this essay certainly helped me organize my thoughts on requirements for information warfare. Most of my thinking was done out loud in conversation with my peers and leaders in N2N6, and so I'd like to thank them for their mentorship, professionalism, and friendship during my tour there. They supported my writing and broadened my thinking. That encouragement was mutually reinforcing, and it helped me immensely. So to any other military personnel considering writing, whether for USNI or elsewhere, I encourage you to find people who will support your drive and offer honest feedback for your ideas. You will certainly grow as a result of your efforts, and that is the greatest reward of all. So thank you again for this honor, and congratulations to USNI. Here's to another 150 years. Now it's my pleasure to announce the winners of the 2022 General Prize Essay Contest. Since 1879, this contest has been the Naval Institute's flagship contest. The list of past winners reads like a who's who of famous naval thought leaders. Then Commander Alfred Thayer Mahan took honorable mention in this contest in its first year. Other winners over the years include notable sea service leaders, many writing long before they achieved their highest rank and fame. Rear Admiral Stephen B. Luce, Lieutenant Ernest J. King, Lieutenant Ned Beach, Lieutenant Commander and later Senator Sam Stratton, Captain Wayne Hughes, Lieutenant Commander Jim Stavridis, Commander Sandy Winnefeld, and Captain Dale Relag are just a few of the notable winners. The General Prize Essay Contest is funded by Andrew and Barbara Taylor, and we thank them for their proud and consistent sponsorship. This year, we received 140 submissions to this contest, a lot of reading, um, and it was also an all-time record. All three of these winning essays are thought-provoking and bear directly on the challenges facing today's sea services. All three appeared in the March issue of Proceedings. This year's third place winner, again, is Captain Sam Tangretti, U.S. Navy retired. Sam's been writing for Proceedings for decades. He won second prize in this contest in 2001, and he took third prize last year. He is the Lidos Chair of Future Warfare Studies at the Naval War College. His essay is titled, Fighting When the Network Dies. Sam receives a medal and a check for $2,000. He's already a life member of the Naval Institute, and he pre-recorded his remarks last week. 
Greetings from Newport. I wish I were there in person to thank each of you for being a member of the Naval Institute and your support for proceedings. I've often said that not a single idea adopted by the Naval Services was not first described, discussed, debated in the pages of our professional journal, often many years before they were adopted. Contributions have ranged from articles by Lieutenant Chester Nimitz on the future of diesel engines to those of Lieutenant Commander Ernest King on air operations to all the outstanding contributions that appear in the journal and on the website today. And you are responsible for helping to bring these ideas to the Department of Defense. I thank you for that. When I'm asked to research a question by OPNAV or others in the Pentagon, the first thing I ask them is, before we reinvent the wheel of good ideas, have you done the literature search in past issues of proceedings? If they haven't, that's the first thing I do. Now, my contribution to the essay contest this year has a very simple message. As we adopt high technology system, we also bring in new vulnerabilities. For the past 30 years, we have fought opponents who could not fight our high technology system. That is not a way that a war against the technological near peer would proceed. My suggestion is that we retain some of the older systems that we otherwise might discard as a hedge against the electromagnetic storm that our high bandwidth requiring, highly network systems do today. I call this the analog fleet, but it's really not analog. But it is the, a hedge that I need think is critical for our ensuring our victory. And I recommend that and some procedures on how to do that. So I thank you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak, write, think issues for the Navy. This year's second prize winner is Lieutenant Commander Aaron Marchant, U.S. Navy. His article, Strategy by Other Means, is a fascinating piece that looks at four dominant schools of U.S. foreign policy and offers Navy force designs that align with those foreign policies. Aaron receives a medal, a check for $3,000, and a one-year extension to his membership of the Naval Institute. He was not able to be here tonight, but he pre-recorded his remarks as well. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Commander Aaron Marchant, and I'm honored to accept second prize in the General Prize Essay Contest. So sorry I can't be with you in person in Annapolis. Right now I'm in Newport, Rhode Island at the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center taking my required leadership courses for the uh, submarine XO pipeline. So if I had flown down, the XO of USS Henry M. Jackson Gold Crew would probably be none too pleased because I wouldn't be able to relieve him not having completed these courses. I want to start off by thanking the Naval Institute for selecting my essay for second prize. For some time, I've been thinking about the idea of how foreign policy connects with naval force structure. And although I never expected this idea to gain much traction, I was pleasantly surprised when I got the call from Mr. Hamlet letting me know the essay was selected. If there's anything I want people to take away from the essay, it's the idea that naval force structure doesn't just happen in a vacuum is driven by the nation's foreign policy. So to understand where we might be headed with force structure, we need to understand the foreign policy schools and kind of gain a common language for, for discussing them. Final thought I want to sign off with is that I probably would have never put pen to paper if it weren't for the forum that the Naval Institute provides for sea service professionals like me. My advice for anyone out there who's thinking big thoughts is to try to get them into essay form. And the perfect way to do that is through the general prize essay contest or any of the other essay contests that the Naval Institute provides. You might be surprised to find how the process of writing really refines your arguments and sharpens the edge of your reasoning. So once again, thank you to the Naval Institute for everything you do, thanks to its members, and congratulations to my fellow award recipients. Go Navy, beat Army.
The first prize winner of this year's General Prize Essay Contest is a civilian and first-time proceedings author, Mr. Mike Sweeney. His article, Submarines Will Reign in a War with China, is getting a lot of attention. Mr. Sweeney receives a gold medal, a check for $6,000, and a one-year membership in the Naval Institute. Unfortunately, he was not able to attend today's ceremony, but please give him a round of applause. Now we're going to move into the Authors of the Year category. And it is my honor to announce the 2022 Proceedings Author of the Year, Lieutenant Kyle Craig, U.S. Navy. It would have been hard to read Proceedings last year and not see an outstanding article or commentary by Lieutenant Craig. A surface warfare officer, Kyle has been a consistent writer for Proceedings for the past few years, and 2022 was a banner year for him. He published two feature articles, a commentary, a Nobody Asked Me But, and several insightful book reviews. I love his book reviews. His writing spans across the sea services and focuses on innovative strategies to win the next war. Kyle was also the runner-up for the Author of the Year contest for 2021. Kyle and his family are in the process of PCSing from Newport to San Diego, where he's uh, moving to be a department head on a West Coast DDG, so he was not able to be with us, but he did pre-record his comments. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the Naval Institute and honored guests, I am deeply grateful to accept the 2022 Proceedings Author of the Year Award. Regrettably, I cannot be with you in person today as I'm currently moving to San Diego with my family for my next tour as Operations Officer in USS Pinckney, DDG on New one. I'd like to thank my family, Admiral Daly, Captains Bill Hamlet and Bill Bray, Jenny Pompey, and the dedicated USMI staff for their support on my pieces over the past year, as well as the fellow authors and thinkers who inspired and challenged me throughout proceedings and elsewhere. At a 1966 speech in South Africa, then Senator Robert Kennedy said, there's a Chinese curse which says, may he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. They're times of danger and uncertainty, but they're also the most creative of any time of the history of mankind. I believe this is as true today as it was then. As we look towards the next 150 years of the Naval Institute, this organization's work remains critical. Whether in person, in print, or online, we must advance the knowledge of sea power, foster dialogue, and promote the highest standards of professional conduct to strengthen our maritime forces and navigate these interesting times. Never forget that the sweat and ink we expend today may preserve blood and steel tomorrow. Whether you participate in the open forum or not, let us redouble our efforts and thereby help to shape the sea surfaces through reason, conviction, collaboration, and inspired by the indomitable spirits to whom we owe our gratitude, both those interred across the street and those who maintain an eternal patrol of the seas. Thank you. I will be followed by the editor-in-chief of Naval History Magazine, my esteemed colleague, Eric Mills. Bill, greetings one and all. Uh, it's my great pleasure at this historic milestone of an annual meeting to present to you the Naval History Author of the Year. He's a rising talent whose work has greatly enhanced the magazine's offerings on the age of fighting sail. William J. Prom graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 2009 and commissioned in the U.S. Marine Corps. He deployed to Afghanistan in 2012 and in 2013 with the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit as an artillery officer. He's currently the development director for Nextop, a veteran service organization. And fortunately for us, he loves to research and write naval history, something for which he displays remarkable gifts. You see, Bill always seems to find new and hitherto largely unexplored or unnoticed paths of inquiry among the well-traveled ground of early US naval history. His pair of outstanding feature articles in 2022 are no exception. The first of these, the Brothers Brown, served up an account of unsung heroes in the War of 1812, when a frenzied arms race unfolded in wilderness shipyards along the U.S.-Canadian borderlands. 
Now, the victories of Perry at Lake Erie and McDonough on Lake Champlain are celebrated in American naval lore. But behind those famed commanders was a pair of genius shipbuilding brothers, Noah and Adam Brown. Bill's work helped to bring these phenomenal individuals out of obscurity and to celebrate their crucial contribution to victory. In a second 2022 feature, when the war against the slave trade picked up steam, Bill's research unearthed an interesting new angle to the Navy's 19th century fight against slave trafficking. It had been a daunting and largely thankless effort for decades. But as Bill discovered as he started digging, the number of the Navy's slave ship interdictions began to enjoy a noteworthy uptick in the late 1850s. Now, why was this? Well, he did some more looking and he realized because the right vessel for the mission had appeared, the screw steamer. Bill's work brought to light a quartet of screw steamer commanders who diligently ran up a remarkable string of slave ship seizures. Naval officers of yesteryear who did heroic work and whose long forgotten deeds were given their due in this article. Both of Bill's features in 2022 offer clear-cut evidence of an adage that we like to live by here, that history, the work of history, is never finished, that all of history has not been written yet, and there are new trails yet to be blazed. This year, this current year, Bill expanded beyond his normal age of sail focus to pen for us a moving tribute to Naval Academy legend and astronaut Willie McCool. So the sky is literally the limit for this author, and we look forward to more great things from him in the future. Now, please join me in welcoming the 2023 Naval History Author of the Year, William J. Prom. Thank you all for uh, coming here. Thank you for this incredible honor. Thank you to the staff of uh, USNI. I'm always amazed at how wonderful my work looks on the printed page, so you, you do a wonderful job. Uh, I was in disbelief when Eric first informed me of this. I still am a little bit. Um, I'm incredibly appreciative of this, especially for these two pieces in particular. Uh, they aren't about the conduct of uh, major battles or larger-than-life historical figures. It's two self-taught shipbuilders during the War of 1812 and a collection of screw steamers fighting the slave trade. The two, two things drew me to both of these stories. First, their relative obscurity, and second, their ability to provide lessons to today. Through the exploits of Noah and Adam Brown, we can see how a healthy commercial shipbuilding industry can have a tremendous impact on naval operations. With the screw steamers, we see that sometimes you have to fight with the fleet that you have. But if you can match your capabilities with adversaries' intent appropriately, you can have an outsized impact. The point is that history matters, all of it. Not just the big battles and flashy characters. Everything has some knowledge to impart, and in studying history, you're able to gain from those past experiences. I was asked what advice I would give to other service members wishing to write more. It's pretty simple. First, start with reading. Read a lot both in volume and variety. Expose yourself to new perspectives and differing opinions. When it comes to writing, be patient and write what you wish you could have been reading about. If you write with a passion about a topic, no matter how narrow or specific it is, you will find an audience. Finally, I need to express my deepest gratitude to my wife, Emily, my children and our families back home. Uh, for their incredible patience with me uh, as I get uh, sucked up and consumed by all these projects. Thank you again. Next up is the director of the Naval Institute Press, Adam Kane, to give the Naval Institute Press Author of the Year. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, I'm the director of the Naval Institute Press, and each year we recognize our author of the year. Uh, our award is focused on naval history or military history or a topic related to the sea services. Over the years, we have handed out 
numerous awards on a variety of subjects, biographies, operational history. On occasion, we have the opportunity to recognize not only the subject of a book, but the author is himself the subject of the book. This year's award winner is Lieutenant Commander Porter Halliburton. Uh, on October 17, 1965, flying in the rear seat of an F-4, Porter was shot down over North Vietnam. For the next seven years, three months, and 28 days, he was a resident of the Hanoi Hilton. For the first 18 months of his captivity, no one outside of the Hilton knew he was alive. Porter's book is a remarkable memoir. It is a story of loss and sorrow. It is a story of love and gain. And in the end, it is about finding and holding on to your humanity and, and ultimately of forgiveness. Unfortunately, Porter can't be here tonight. He is up somewhere in New England, uh, speaking to a variety of groups this week, talking about his experiences and, uh, and, and promoting his work. But he did submit a video uh, for us this evening, and so I will turn it over to Porter. Emma Dooley and members of the Naval Institute, um, I regret that I cannot be with you in person today, but the Redwood Library in Newport has asked me to speak about this little book that I have written. However, I am so very honored and gratified to now be included in the long list of distinguished authors published by the Institute over the past century and a half. And I want to thank all of you at the Institute and the press who have helped to make this a reality. I'm also gratified by the interest that readers have shown in these stories because I wrote them in order to convey the powerful lessons that we learned in captivity, the positive aspects of a long and difficult time, the courage and wisdom of our leaders and others who showed us the way by their examples. There were also the humor, the amazing resilience and adaptability of the human mind, body, and spirit. And most of all, the powerful and liberating gifts that we all have of choice and forgiveness. Choosing to forgive frees our lives of hatred and makes room for joy. Victor Frankl, the Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, Edie Iger, Jim Stockdale, and so many others have said that we learn the most about life, its meaning, and ourselves, not so much through success and even happiness, but through suffering and failure. We all will have suffering in our lives, and we must choose how to react to it. You must also know how important poetry was to my daily life as a prisoner and to my survival. I've continued to write, and this October, October 17th exactly, I will have a book published by Stone Tower Press entitled Old Pine, and other poems from a long and fortunate life. My life has been long and so very fortunate. I am so thankful to all of you for this wonderful day, and I leave you with my sincere thanks. Thank you all again. That concludes our awards presentation. I will now turn this back over to Admiral Daly. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Pivotal moments in sea service history and the Naval Institute's role in tackling those big issues frames a centrally important part of this year's annual meeting. My distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, naval historian and author, Dr. Craig Simons. His award-winning published histories are more than 20 in number. His most recent book is Nimitz at War, 
command leadership from Pearl Harbor to Tokyo Bay. Just weeks ago, he was honored by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library with their Literature Award. It's a prestigious award recognizing the author's entire body of work, enriching the understanding of military history and war. Dr. Simons is an author of Naval Institute articles and books, including the masterful Naval Institute Historical Atlas of the U.S. Navy. From 1971 to 74, he served as a naval officer on active duty and indeed taught naval strategy as an ensign while on the staff and faculty of the Naval War College. In 1976, he joined the History Department of the Naval Academy and progressed from assistant professor up to full professor of history, served four years as chairman of the department, and he was recognized with appointment as professor emeritus of the department upon his retirement from the Naval Academy in 2005. We're proud to have him as a member. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Craig Simons. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have to say I'm a little bit daunted uh, having listened to these wonderful young and some not so young uh, authors uh, talk about their work. Uh, that really is a reflection of why the Naval Institute not only survives but succeeds. We are here to celebrate the sesquicentennial, that is the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Naval Institute here in Annapolis. The idea, both at the time and still, was to provide an independent forum for those who cared about the U.S. Navy and wanted to advance it, to promote it, and to do so in a venue that was outside official channels. In that respect, though the Institute inhabits a building, actually several buildings, including this magnificent new center, on the Naval Academy campus, it is not a house organ. It is not simply a conduit for the official view of anything. It is instead the one thing that every large organization needs and yet few actually have a knowledgeable and sympathetic outside voice, one that is often supportive, but which can be critical at need, a sounding board and not an echo chamber. It may sometimes be annoying, even embarrassing, to the actual establishment, but it is absolutely essential. And for the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Naval Institute is that voice. The megaphone is much bigger now than it was 150 years ago and includes not only the indispensable journal proceedings, but also, as we have seen and heard, books, talks, podcasts, a robust and growing social media presence, daily news highlights, and conferences like this one. The first president of the Institute was John L. Warden, who was at the time superintendent of the Naval Academy and famously the commander of the USS Monitor in the Battle of Hampton Roads during the Civil War. In the 1870s, he and the other plank holders of the Institute were concerned about the drawdown of naval forces after the Civil War and what implications that might have for the future of their service to the country. Those plank holders got a frightening glimpse into the perils of not paying attention almost at once in 1873 when a Spanish warship stopped, searched, and interned the steamship Virginius. Built initially as a Civil War blockader, blockade runner rather, she had been purchased after the war by a group of Americans who were sympathetic to the Cuban rebels who were then fighting a war of independence against Spain. 
The objective of the men who bought the Virginius was to use her to smuggle men, arms, and munitions to the rebels. As her captain, they hired Joseph Fry, who was, incidentally, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and who had served during the Civil War as a Confederate naval officer. On October 30th, 1873, exactly 21 days after the founding of the Naval Institute, a Spanish warship intercepted the Virginius at sea, took her into Santiago Harbor on Cuba's south coast. There, Fry and his entire crew were quickly tried, condemned as pirates, and sentenced to be shot by firing squad. 53 of them, including Fry, were indeed shot and killed. American newspapers clamored for war, and President Grant sent Spain an ultimatum, and to underscore that ultimatum, he ordered the Navy to mobilize. Well, that was easier said than done. The mothballed Civil War monitors ordered to assemble at Key West had old rusty engines, and in any case, with their low freeboard marginal buoyancy, the monitors had never been designed for service in the open ocean anyway. And as a result, the mobilization of the American fleet at Key West proved more of an embarrassment than a threat. Now, in the end, the crisis of this so-called Virginius affair was resolved without anyone going to war. Spain apologized, paid an indemnity to the families of the slain, and the public temperament quickly cooled to re be replaced by other issues, including the opening of the West and the enforcement of the recently enacted Ku Klux Klan Act. To those who were paying attention, though, those like Warden and the others who founded the Naval Institute, this was a cautionary note evidence that the traditional American reaction to almost any crisis, going into it underprepared, furiously mobilizing, fighting the war, and then demobilizing just as fast, that this might not be a template suitable for the coming century. That, of course, had been the American way of war up to 1873. The size and capability of the U.S. Navy had fluctuated wildly since its birth in the late 18th century, adding ships and manpower for the Quasi-War, the War of 1812, obviously the Civil War, then swiftly casting them aside with the return of peace. In 1861, for example, the United States Navy had a total of 42 active warships. Five years later, it had 671. Five years after that, it was back to 52. This fluctuation, this sine wave, if you would, of naval power is what Warden and the other founding members of the Institute worried about. And from that moment to this, the pages of the proceedings served not only as a sounding board to consider the wisdom of peacetime naval policy, but also where the newest aspects of changing technology were considered, proposed, modified, adjusted. Sometimes that led to the adoption of a new platform. Sometimes it exposed the fallacy of an idea, which is just as important. In particular, the proceedings has been a place for junior officers to raise questions and issues that otherwise might not have made its way up the official chain of command to receive serious attention. We heard from some of those young officers today. And look at who some of the others have been. Lieutenant Bradley Fisk. Lieutenant, as we have heard, Ernest King, Lieutenant Chester Nimitz, Dudley Knox, William S. Pye, Hyman Rickover. The format of the proceedings has changed over the years. I've got a, uh, a show and tell here, I think. 
You've seen this one earlier today already. Here's the cover of the 1874 edition, actually published in 1875. Here is a cover from 1912. I know you can't read it from where you're sitting, but the lead article is about the practical use of submarines by a young lieutenant named Chester Nimitz. Here is one from the year I joined the U.S. Navy in 1971, and here, of course, is the most recent issue. In many ways, the Institute and the proceedings in particular are a mirror one that reflects the issues of all kinds that dominate naval planning, policy, and performance. But it is a two-way mirror. While it reflects contemporary issues, it also projects future possibilities, proposing, predicting, even propelling future platforms, policies, procedures. All of these issues, by the way, remain available today in bound copies. Now, I know a lot of people here access articles online, but I am old school. I like thumbing the bound volumes. I have often gone into the Nimitz Library here at the Academy, sat down to read a particular article from an old issue of the proceedings, and then as one article led to another, I get pulled down into the rabbit hole to a whole smorgasbord of ideas that show me what was being considered and thought and proposed at any given moment in the long history of the United States Navy. I'm currently working on the 1930s, and in the proceedings I can read what Navy officers were thinking about in the 1930s. What naval warfare in the Pacific might look like should one come about. How to conduct amphibious landings on defended beaches. The future, if any, of naval aviation. And the broader implications of war itself. Here are officers, often young officers, struggling with questions about the validity or the humanity of submarine warfare, aerial bombing of civilian targets, as well as more practical issues about targeting and dive angles. Sometimes I read about programs and platforms that ended up as dead ends. But they too show us the fluid character of naval thought. Here are the back and forth arguments about the relative merits of lighter than air dirigibles versus fixed wing aircraft. I mean, after all, dirigibles can stay aloft for days, not fixed wing aircraft. Are you sure that's the way you want to go? Much later, arguments about the relative merits of guns versus missiles for air defense. Absent these discussions, how much longer would it have taken the United States to perceive and more importantly, respond to new realities. No doubt Navy officers would have thought about some of these things, maybe all of these things, even if the proceedings had never existed. But absent a platform to express those views and an audience to consider them and then to argue back in future articles, would they have had the kind of impact needed to affect change? We all remember the old riddle about a tree falling in the forest. Does it make a sound if no one is there to hear it? In the same way, does an idea in the mind of one man, one woman, make an impact absent a venue to share it? The proceedings reported not only on events and ideas in the U.S. Navy, it kept naval officers abreast of events elsewhere in other countries, in other navies, at a time when most Americans paid little or no attention to events overseas. There are articles on the tactics and strategy of the Russo-Japanese War, as well as, indeed, sometimes interminably, considerations of the Battle of Jutland. There are lots of reflections on naval history in the proceedings. But of course, as we know, since 1987, most of the historical pieces that might otherwise have appeared in the proceedings now appear 
in the Institute's other journal, Naval History, the leading periodical of its type, and my personal favorite. I spent a lot of time talking about the Institute's periodicals, which for more than 100 years have been the centerpiece of the organization, but let me just mention at least a few other roles the Institute has played. Now, you've seen this image already. I, uh, it was, stole my thunder a little bit. The check written in 1926 with which the Institute provided the seed money to the Naval Historical Foundation. Todd Creekman sent me a copy of this in the hope that I would mention it. Here it is, Todd. I want you to note that it is for a thousand dollars, real money in 1926. As an example of how much things have changed though, here is a copy of the Blue Jackets manual from 1917, another product of the Institute. I found this image on eBay. It's for sale for, can you guess? $1,000. <laughs> In addition, of course, there is, as we have seen this afternoon, the Institute's book publishing arm, the Naval Institute Press. Founded in 1898, only 25 years after the organization itself, the press has published literally hundreds of books, none more important than the Blue Jackets Manual, first published, as Pete mentioned, in 1902, a copy of which was handed to me in boot camp in 1970, and a copy of which uh, is still being published today. I have to put up the one with Tom Cutler's name on it. He made me do this. <laughs> the Naval Institute Press publishes many other professional books, many of which are also manuals of a sort, including the Petty Officer's Drill Book, the Manual of Wireless Telegraphy, and the Division Officer's Guide. Others have explored more philosophical topics, such as how navies fight, by Frank Ulig or Wayne Hughes' book on fleet tactics. The press has rescued a number of classics from out-of-date dustbins, including Julian Corbett's Principles of Maritime Strategy, J.C. Wiley's Military Strategy, and Samuel Elliott Morrison's History of Naval Operations in World War II. And also, history books. I I am a naval historian, and I am delighted, though no longer surprised, whenever I go into Nimitz Library looking for detailed information about a particular topic of naval history, I find that at least 85% of the books that I need to guide me are Naval Institute Press books. And while I'm speaking of books, this year the Naval Institute will release Dennis Cliff's New book, here is the cover of that one, aptly entitled The Pen and the Sword, which goes into far more detail about the Naval Institute than I can here. So let me end by simply repeating what Captain Roy Smith said 100 years ago in 1923. With the possible, possible exception of the Naval War College at Newport, no other source has so greatly furthered the material development and professional advancement of the Navy than the Naval Institute. Congratulations to all of us. Thank you. And let me call Bill back to the podium. Bill? Uh, our panelists today are super users of the open forum. Oh. And what they've written over the last <clears throat> number of years has had significant impact. Uh, Commander Craig Allen, U.S. Coast Guard, is a Cutterman, a Naval Institute life member, and co-author of the ninth edition of Farwell's Rules of the Nautical Road, published by the Naval Institute Press. He has won our Coast Guard essay contest, I dare say, an uncountable number of times. Um, and he's written a total of 11 proceedings articles. He commanded the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Steadfast WMEC 623 and is now completing a one-year National Security Fellowship at Harvard University. Lieutenant Andrea Howard, U.S. Navy, is a submarine officer currently serving as a navigator on the USS New Jersey SSN 796, 
Following her graduation from the US Naval Academy in 2015, Andrea was a Marshall Scholar at the University of Oxford and King's College London, where she focused on the intersection of technology, security, and diplomacy in weapons of mass destruction policy. She won our Emerging and Disrupt Disruptive Technology Essay Contest in 2019, has written a total of four proceedings articles. She's also been published in SimSec and War on the Rocks. And Lieutenant Howard is currently a member of the Naval Institute's editorial board. And Captain James A. L.J. Winnefeld III, U.S. Marine Corps, is a fire support officer currently serving as a Marine Corps recruiter in Washington State. He graduated from the Naval Academy in 2018, published his first proceedings article in 2019, and won the CNO Naval History Essay Contest in 2020. LJ's written four articles and commentaries for proceedings. Captain Winnefeld is also an apple that did not fall far from the proverbial tree. Both his father and grandfather wrote for proceedings during their careers and won essay contests as well. Please join me in welcoming Craig, Andrea, and LJ. I also want to remind people that we have microphones, and if you're in the virtual audience, please submit your, your uh, questions for us, for them uh, especially. So as we get through this, uh, I've got a few questions to ask them, but I know your questions will be even better. Uh, so Dr. Simons hit the highlights of our history and made the salient point that proceedings has been a place for junior officers, and I would add, very importantly, a place for enlisted professionals to it raise questions, issues, and ideas that might never have made it up the chain of command. So I want to ask the three of you, I'll start with, uh, with uh, Craig. How has the Institute impacted you in your careers? All right, uh, thank you, Bill. Um, so I, I would say that there, there's two main ways that the, the, the Institute has really impacted me. And the first one is just every time I pick up a, an episode or a, uh, an issue of Naval and Suit Proceedings, I always learn something new and valuable. And for me, uh, that, that's just been, it, it's even going back to my, my first days underway on uh, my first unit. I'd, I'd go to the uh, wardroom in the morning, get a cup of coffee, flip through proceedings. And there's always something in there that just made me think, wow. And every once in a while, there's an article that comes, comes along that it's not just informative, but it really changes my perspective on something and kind of gives me an aha moment that makes me see things in a new light. And there have been several of those over the years that I've really appreciated, and I go back and reread often. And I think the second thing that it's done is it's inspired me to not just be a consumer, but also to be a contributor. And uh, I have the Read, Think, Write, and Publish, written by uh, Admiral Retired Stev Redis, uh, as a shortcut on my desktop. And every once in a while, I open it up and I reread it again because it reminds me, like, hey, I, I should need to get off my duff and probably do some more uh, contributions. So having that amazing forum to write for has been uh, has been great and I, I really enjoy doing it. Andrea? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm incredibly excited to be here to speak on this stage for the first time. I had the privilege of speaking on a panel that was chaired by CNO John Richardson at Sea Air Space this year and it was called Towards a Culture of Unity. And the Naval Institute, I think, is one of these bastions of unity for the maritime services. And it's not uniformity that we're talking about. It's about a patchwork quilt where you bring together disparate ideas to make a stronger, unified entity. But there's still color. There's still a compelling element to, to that. And so the three themes that I offered on how we get towards that culture of unity really apply to the Naval Institute as well and my experience with the Naval Institute. So the first is culture forging. Having driven up here in between three section duty to speak on this panel, I can very much so attest that there feels like many times that there's a disparate nature to our naval service. There's the deck plate reality, and then the big thoughts that everyone's talking about today. I encourage junior officers in my wardrooms to read proceedings. However, I really want to say that uh, Developing the Naval Mind by Captain John Fryman and, and Commander Ben Armstrong laid a very clear foundation for how you can implement that on a day-to-day -day basis in your wardrooms. That's how you forge that culture of unity of thought for strengthening our Navy services. The second piece is representation. I think it's worth noting that in a very short 1 15th slice of the Naval Institute history that it is, it's been possible for somebody like me to wear this warfare insignia. 
and the Naval Institute has been a great ally in how to prepare for being one of those leaders at the forefront of this integration of submarines of this warfare community. I look to Sharon Disher's book published by the Naval Institute, First Class, for some gouge on what those experiences might be like. But then as much as there are differences, there's also similarities that come from these experiences. So as I was preparing to go to my first submarine, I read um, on Leading Snipes by then Lieutenant Commander James Savridis to get a little bit of gouge of what it is like to work with those folks who make the steam and keep the boat moving. And it's been incredibly insightful to draw from those lessons learned to see how our service in the Navy, in the maritime services, can be both different and yet the same. And then the third piece that I'll talk about is allyship. And as a department head, I relish in the opportunity to course correct junior officers and ensigns in particular. So I think you're actually wrong. We want to hear from people like you. You are the exact voice that can help propel forward that unity of thought that we're trying to achieve, right? We want people to write. We want to hear from the deck plate voices. And so by the Naval Institute being that ally for me and giving me the confidence to have this voice, I was then able to encourage Lieutenant, Lieutenant Phoebe Kotlikoff, who was a senior junior officer on Ohio with me, and Lieutenant Commander to Emma McCarthy, who is my engineer, is now the CNO's naval aide, to both write about the realities that we were experiencing in the shipyard and how we could better inform future experiences for naval vessels. And I'll also just say that allyship can sometimes come in the form of uh, bringing together people against a common cause. So serving on the Ed Board and reading Commander Joel Holwitz's piece about making mandatory tenure uh, service <laughs> commitments for the submarine community, for those junior officers, rally together people to really talk about the root causes of retention for our service and how we can ultimately retain people and bring people in so that we can forge that culture of unity. So like I said, it's just a pleasure to be here and to have personally and then at a more national and international level experienced how the Naval Institute speaks to the values of the United States and speaks to those values of unity. Thank you. LJ? Sir, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Admiral Daly, the entire Naval Institute. Uh, I love this place, and it's really awesome to be back on the yard on a beautiful day, away from rainy Seattle, where I came from. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd say the Naval Institute has impacted my career in really two ways. Uh, the first one is being a consumer of proceedings and the Naval Institute Press. I can't tell you the number of books that I have from the Naval Institute Press that I've read throughout my career. Uh, but really being tied into the force uh, and, and becoming a more knowledgeable junior officer by reading both my peers' work, but also uh, some really senior leaders going all the way up to our commandant and our chief of naval operations. But I'd say the second part, and perhaps the more profound impact on my life uh, and on my career, is really learning how to think well. And that's done by writing for this amazing publication and having the disciplined thought to meet the standard that it takes to be published in proceedings. What I found is that has a knock-on effect uh, on every other aspect of my career. It's allowed me to think more clearly as a platoon commander or as an executive officer, uh, and definitely a lot more clearly as a officer, selection officer uh, out on independent duty. Uh, and I think that I really believe that that was uh, due to the fact that I've uh, written multiple times for proceedings. And that's why I encourage every single junior officer that I run into and every midshipman that I run into to really start that at a young age because I've felt that development in my career as I've written more and more, going all the way back uh, to I actually was published as a midshipman uh, in the Naval Institute. So from that very first article way back in 2017 until now, I can, I can feel my thinking getting more clear, more organized, and I, I think it'll continue to have a strong uh, impact on my, on my career moving forward. So in the opposite order, coming back towards me, um, on any article that you've written, uh, did you get the feedback you were looking for? What kind of um, discussion was generated by it? What kind of feedback did you get from uh, fellow JOs or from the deck plates or from perhaps even the highest levels of your service if you got any, any feedback? Yes, sir. So I'll start with, uh, I wrote an article in November of, I think it was 2021, called Nemesis Now, which talked about, I was really fortunate uh, when I was a first lieutenant to be the executive officer for the battery that was taking on the new anti-ship missile system for the Marine Corps. Uh, a brand new technology had never been experimented with before, and the Marine Corps wisely decided to put it in the hands of Lance Corporals before, uh, before they put it in the hands of, of majors and lieutenant colonels. Uh, and it was really amazing to see uh, you know, the creativity that those young Marines uh, brought to bear on that system. Uh, and I felt like you know, we were not necessarily postured correctly as a force 
uh, to completely take advantage of all the capabilities that this system will provide. Uh, and so I wrote an article about it, and I got a lot of discussion from my battalion and members of my regiment uh, that didn't necessarily disagree, uh, but wanted to engage in conversation. Uh, and I think it brought a little bit of legitimacy to the fact that, hey, there, here was this 26-year-old first lieutenant executive officer who's actually really thinking about this problem. Uh, and I got a few phone calls and I had a few meetings afterwards with people who were deeply ingrained with bringing this system online. Uh, and I, I really felt that it, it allowed us to empower those Lance Corporals for the ideas that they had to actually have a voice, whether it was through me, I just was the conduit. Uh, but I felt like that was a, a, a big you know, contribution that having actually been published in the Naval Institute you know, affected some change in the Marine Corps. Yeah, there's a lot of chatter right now about who should be representing the Navy to the, to the national audience, to the international audience. We've, we've all seen the most recent headlines. And in an interview I did recently for a podcast, I was asked about how I got my start at feeling more comfortable as a public voice. And that is where the, the Naval Institute really came in for me. So not in any particular article, but by the series of articles that I've written on tactical nuclear weapons, on hypersonics, on tips for getting your fish. Those were the first instances that I had of posting online publicly about the voice that I wanted to create as a professional in this organization, and where I started getting traction and feedback from, like you said, not only other junior officers, but from senior leaders in the organization. So when we talk about the impact that that writing can have, I, I tell folks that it is a way to you know, jump the chain of command and speak to the deck plate about the realities that we're facing, the challenges that we're facing, but more importantly, the solutions that we can offer based and informed upon that, that deck plate ex experience. And so that direct line of communication, which, like I said, allows you to, to, to step up that chain is just incredibly fulfilling and important. And one of the main reasons that I tell people to get their voices out there so that they can help inform the future decisions that are being made. Great. Craig? Yeah, I, I think the so the concepts for for the articles they don't they don't come out of nowhere they don't come out of a vacuum so I found that one of the best uh, inspirations for things to write articles about is when you're up on the bridge and it's the mid watch and it's dark and there's not a lot going on and that's the time when people start chattering and they they try to solve the world's problems right and those those ideas you, you start pulling the thread a little bit and it starts kind of gnawing at you in the back of the head and you think well this there's something to that and then you have to do the kind of the disciplined nug work to to put that into a cogent idea so by the time it, it ends up published in in an article form it's 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 something that's been on a lot of people's minds so I've, I've found it very rewarding that um, people who, who I've discussed it with uh, or, or who have chimed in at, at different points um, will, will reach out to me and say, you know, wow, you know, that was, that was, that was really well, well put. I think that, that was it. I'm glad this idea is finally out there. Or, oh, that's not what we meant at all. Um, sometimes the feedback is a little mixed. Um, but uh, I, I do remember the first article I, I got published um, when I was a lieutenant, I kind of had this, like, wow, I got published in proceedings. You know, the commandant's going to call me and say, you know, Craig, this, uh, <laughs> this idea of yours is, 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 uh, is great. Um, that hasn't happened so far. <laughs> but that's not to say that it hasn't uh, um, planted some seeds. Well, I, I think your article, Connectivity Maketh the Cutter, has had an impact, whether the commandant called you or not, right? That was one that, you know, you pointed out that the national security cutters are amazing ships, um, but the Coast Guard still wasn't investing enough in the connectivity, particularly for some of those DOD missions and, and operating with the Navy. Navy's got a lot of bandwidth, a lot of radar, you know, antennas and, you know, connectivity, but the Coast Guard out there operating with them didn't. But then that turned into some, some, you know, budget authority that actually helped, you know, ameliorate some of that problem. Right? So I did, I did get an email from uh, the Coast Guard 06 who was in charge of the cutter connectivity, and he was none too pleased with me, <laughs> saying, don't you understand, we're doing what we can. Um, thanks for this. But, <laughs> but hey, if we got the ball rolling in the right direction, that was, that was the way to go. So I, I want to encourage folks in the audience, if you have a question for our, uh, our panel here, I have one more question, um, which uh, is, what can we do better? What can the Naval Institute be do better? So, you know, we've been around for 150 years. You've seen what proceedings looked like in, 18, in the 1870s. 
Uh, I was looking at a, a, an issue from 1916 today that a, a gentleman who's a member uh, called me last week and said, hey, I've got this um, issue that was owned by my great-grandfather, Tossig. Uh, would you like it? I said, yes, absolutely. So looking at uh, proceedings from 100 years ago is pretty amazing. Um, but you know, what can we do better? What can we do to serve today's deck plates level um, how do we reach people perhaps better than we are? What are some products uh, that we don't have that we ought to have? What are some things maybe that we are doing that you know could we, we could let go of? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, I think there, first of all, I just want to say that there's there's so many things that that you do well um, that I think it's worth just pointing out. If, if you were to ask this question, t uh, maybe even 10 years ago, you know, you could say, well, print media is kind of in trouble. It's it's all going online. Uh, people like to listen to podcasts versus reading the news and. And you're already doing that. You have a, a fantastic online presence. I think we, we saw some, some statistics that, that prove that already. The podcast is very popular. Um, so I think we're reaching a lot of the audiences in the different formats than we were before. Um, and just a lot of little things. Uh, the way that you guys treat the, the contest winners is, is just, it's, it's red carpet, it's, it's, it's outstanding. Um, getting handwritten notes from Admiral Daly or, or uh, Admiral Stavridis for different articles is, is just, I mean, that's just, you think, wow, that's really cool. Um, so you guys just do a lot of things really well. Um, so I, I have a lot of gratitude for that. I think the one thing um, over the course of um, you know, my, my writing, if I was gonna say maybe we could improve one thing, it would just be sometimes when you submit an article, um, you get that submission received, and then a long time goes by. <laughs> And so you're kind of you kind of start getting a little anxious, like, hey, is this going to make it or not, or do I need to start maybe looking for another? And that's that's just that I know that's the you know because proceedings is the flagship media, but now we're competing against all of these blogs and, and websites that you know they can turn things around instantly. So I think maybe some people might might be disincentivized from uh, publishing there because they know it's going to be a long time. So you get a lot of submissions, and you know you can only read so many at a time. Andrew knows this well, being on the editorial board. But I think anything that you could do to expedite just that, you know, we're going to do this or not, I think that would be a, a win. Good feedback. Thank you. Andrea? Perhaps this, in, this answer is influenced by our surroundings today, but more in-person events, and specifically those targeted at, at younger demographics that are going to be lifelong prospective members of the Institute. So Steve put on a tremendous DARE innovation workshop in San Diego that I had the pleasure of participating in and then got to be one of the folks briefing the CNO on force design recommendations. And so with that, you know, you could do a DARE innovation on the yard that brings in midshipmen as well to help them start thinking about these big questions and serving as future interlocutors of their respective sea services because that event for me in particular was just a little bit eye-opening you know seeing the themes that are talked about in submarines will rain which is a tremendous article having not percolated out to you know my, my shipmates in the in the other maritime services be that marines or coast guard and and so having forums like the dare innovation workshop allows somebody for me from a traditional silent service help communicate the objectives and the lines of effort that we have in our service and how that will build that interoperable picture that an article like Submarines Will Rain talks about the necessity and drives home the importance of. Great, thank you. LJ? Yeah, so I, I think that oftentimes we, th we think that when JO's right, they really only have a tactical level mindset and influence uh, and that they are looking at what's right in front of them here and now uh, and providing really awesome ways to improve what is immediately in front of them in the close fight. Uh, I think we've seen here today that there have been a couple of midshipmen and junior officers that have written about big strategic concepts that kind of challenge some of our fundamental assumptions about how we're going to operate moving forward. Uh, but I think that we need more of that. And I think that one of the best ways to do that is as an artillery officer, as a liaison, uh, you know, fire supportman, uh, I think that the best way off of your point is to get in front of people and to look them in the eye. And I think part of the problem is, is that every unit I've been to in the Marine Corps, nobody below the rank of 04 knows what proceedings is, unless they went to the Naval Academy. And that's even though, you know, when I went through the basic school, uh, we had Ward Carroll come and talk to us about uh, proceedings and getting published and all that. <clears throat> he spared dropping my name, which was really nice of him. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're going through those entry level programs, you're just trying to get your feet underneath you. And so I think getting out there and getting to the deck plates, getting to the ships, to the, to the submarines, to the squadrons, to the battalions, 
to the regiments and looking those junior officers and those, those junior enlisted in the eye and saying, hey, this is a forum for you to, to speak your mind. And even if you're not that great of a writer or you don't think that you're that great of a writer, we can help you get your piece or get your idea to print so that you can have an impact on the force. Uh, and I think you know, doing more events, highlighting stuff like D.A.R.E. The only re I applied for D.A.R.E. and the only reason why I knew is because a, a friend of mine shared it on social media. Um, so uh, getting in front of these, these junior sailors and Marines and look, really looking them in the eye and getting out there to the fleet, uh, you know, as opposed to just hitting TBS or you know, whatever the equivalent uh, on the Navy side, I think that's a, that could be a, a big impact to get more of us, because there's a lot of us in here, but I don't know if it's really going to get outside of this room, the impact that some of these young officers have had uh, in midshipmen, and I think that that's a great way to, to really have an impact. Okay, great point. Questions from the audience? Looks like we got somebody coming down here. Tire surface warfare officer, so I, I thought I'd break the ice. First of all, Admiral Daly and the entire Institute staff, such an impressive place that the Institute has, is, has gone to at this point and is going forward in the future. And an incredibly impressive group of, of awardees today. So I'm interested, uh, I'm making an assumption here that all of you intend to write again for the Institute, what it is that you're considering writing next and why. Awesome, Greg. Sure. So um, I've been uh, kind of contemplating for a while the, the idea of what what is what is a great power Coast Guard. What does that mean? So I think when it when it kind of dawned on me when I saw the Coast Guard um, come up so many times in the latest national security strategy in the context of uh, near peer competition and, and what they want to use the the Coast Guard for. That that's that's pretty different than. Um, than what most Coast Guards get used for. And I, I think that's something that, if you go back to sort of the, the main theory, uh, Mahan or, or Corbett, you don't really find much in there at all. In fact, there was a, an article about that recently. It's, you know, that Mahan doesn't talk about the Coast Guard. So we, we do something, the US Coast Guard does something different. I think we're starting to see sort of a mirror image uh, of, of China trying to do some of those things as well. And there's kind of this, this idea that we need to, we're going to deploy Coast Guard cutters to, to the Arctic and to the uh, Western Pacific for, for something. And I think we, we need to define that a, a little better because it's part of our national security strategy now. And I think so there's a lot of, uh, of thought that can go into that. And so that's kind of what I've been working on for my next article. I have, I have sort of two themes uh, that have been swimming around my head, both in the vein of lessons learned, which we really love in the submarine force, a good lessons learned message. So the first on a really po positive side is focused on the integration of junior enlisted women on board our vessels. So there's only six submarines that are fully integrated with junior enlisted women of all ranks. And I have the, the kind of party trick of saying that I am the only officer who's overseen the integration of two of those to include the first fast attack that has junior enlisted women. So Emma McCarthy and I, again, my engineer from Ohio, we've chatted about the, the, the option of potentially writing an article about good deck plate lessons learned and also some cultural faux pas that should be avoided in the future follow-on integration of these vessels. The second one is, is a shipyard lessons learned piece to kind of continue the, the flow of ideas that Lieutenant Kotlikoff offered that I had mentioned earlier as well. Uh, as an example, my commanding officer recently wanted to qualify our supply officer, our CHOP as we colloquially call them, duty officer because we can't go underway and the intent of having somebody qualified surface officer deck as a duty officer is to emergency egress the submarine from port in the event of weather or terrorist activity or anything of, of that vein. And our immediate superior in command told him no. And we've seen a number of iterations of these types of conversations where the ethos of at-sea submarines is regarded as, as us being apex predators, and that's the guidance from Vice Admiral Houston. But for the deck plate leaders in the shipyard, some of those same levels of trust have been absent. So there is a diplomatic way to, to fashion that argument, and I think at some point it deserves to go out there. So I've got two, and I'll, I'll be quick with them. Uh, the first one is uh, a look at how we integrate our naval fire, uh, surface fire support with the, the ground element uh, and with the Marine Corps. I'm working on it with a lieutenant, Lieutenant Cole, U.S. Navy lieutenant, and we're just kind of diving into some of the deficiencies and some of the atrophied skills uh, that we've lost over time, especially with two ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The second one 
is you know, looking at what the right mindset is for recruiting in today, in this day and age. Uh, as an officer selection officer, I deal with this uh, on a daily basis. I've, I've been at this for about a year. Uh, and the kind of mindset that it takes uh, you know, to be successful, what I, what I tell my team is we have to fight the jungle, not the enemy. The jungle being propensity to serve medical issues uh, with Genesis and all this other stuff that we've, we've put into the system, things that we cannot necessarily control. Uh, but instead, finding those individuals that are you know, open to service or may not have ever considered service, uh, but if we show them, hey, the Naval Service is a worthwhile venture for your career, or at least the beginning of your career, we can make some significant headway. Uh, and so I'm toying around with that idea as a potential future article as well. Well, thank you all. Uh, they, they all sound like great topics, and I wish you luck in winning prizes next year. I mean, Greener has Thank the next you. question, uh, then I've got John one for Greener, retired Navy officer. Uh, my question <laughs> is recruiting and retention. And I, you may have answered the question. I didn't know that. But uh, your experience as a recruiter, LJ. And then, Andrea, as a department head, and then Craig, you know, as a commanding officer, uh, a lot of challenges out there, obviously, and maybe challenges I don't recall for a long, long time that we have in recruiting, and in some cases, retention. So if you are putting together an article, and maybe you are, or just talking in open forum, uh, elements of a good marine recruiting program, and maybe you're living it right now, so just lay it out for us what that is, because many of us out there don't know. I know Berger's written some nice articles, but is that... You know, is that what you're really doing now? Just a little bit on that. And then your reflections uh, as a department head to say, hey, this is what we need for good retention, especially in a high-tech area where so many resources put into people and then poof, they're gone. And then, Craig, of course, what you've seen, because we're looking for future commanding officers and beyond to serve beyond. So those thoughts, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so for the recruiting aspect, uh, I was at West in 2022, uh, and the Cal and I got a similar question about recruiting. Uh, and we had spoken beforehand, uh, and I told him I was going off to be an OSO. And he called me out in the crowd and said he's going to work his tail off the next three years. And boy, was he right. Uh, and with the Marine Corps, our emphasis on recruiting and the work ethic, I think it's second to none. We, I've worked harder on this duty than I ever did in the fleet, ever did, you know, except for deployment. Uh, I'm working hard, harder now. Uh, and I, what I think that that is, is it's, you know, our Marine Corps recruiters, just like I was talking about getting in front of people and looking them in the eye, we have a presence in every single high school in America and every single college in America to include community colleges. We're at every single event and we're there looking the part, dressed the part, uh, and, and we're really putting every effort into it, even if we don't think anything's going to come out of it. And you're able to get in now? We're able to get in. Yep. At, at COVID, uh, after 2022, we're able to get into every single uh, institution. Uh, but I really, truly do believe uh, that it is showing up to the fight, not already defeated. Because a lot of recruiters, uh, and we see this a little bit within the Marine Corps, is showing up, oh, they're never going to join. You know, there's, there's a propensity to serve that's lower than it's ever been before. And frankly, in my experience, that's simply not true. Right? And they may need a little bit more convincing than they did in the past. But you can find individuals. And I'm finding people in Seattle, Washington. I live two blocks away from where the you know, Capitol Hill autonomous zone was uh, you know, during 2020. And we're still making mission in Seattle. Uh, you know, and, and so I really do believe it's the proper mindset and the presence. You know, fighting the enemy, not the jungle, and being there and working hard. Uh, and then one of the things that I love about the Marine Corps, too, is that coming out on recruiting uh, duty is rewarded because we know that it's the toughest thing that a Marine will do, whether they're on the officer side or on the enlisted side. And it's an independent duty where we put a lot of trust and faith into staff sergeants and sergeants to go out there, operate on their own, get into the schools, conduct themselves professionally when a kid's telling them to you know, F off uh, and still maintain that bearing. Um, you know, I think that that is, is really powerful. And I think that's part of the reason why the Marine Corps is so good at it is because we reward those Marines. And we tell them, hey, this is tough, but we're putting a lot of faith in you. Uh, and on the back side of this, you're going to be taken care of. Uh, so those, those, those aspects. Sir. Yes, sir. I'll take a page from your book and answering your question. So seven years and 353 days ago, but who's counting? Uh, you commissioned my Navy cadre into the fleet. And 
You could have, in that speech, just strictly have talked about the pivot to Asia that Secretary Hillary Clinton, Secretary, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, had talked about, I think, a couple weeks previous and at one of our conferences or a four-star lecture. You could have focused you know, strictly on the force design of the fleet, but you made a comment and recommendation to us. You said, I, I need you to do two things when you get to the fleet. You said, write your mother and wear sunscreen. <laughs> You could have add, added on, you know, right for proceedings as well, but, you know, I digress. <laughs> so, yeah, but it was in that moment you embodied a concept that Thomas Friedman and Thank You for Being Late called Stempathy, right? It's a combining of the technological, the material reality with empathy. And that's really what we need in the force right now for recruitment and retention. So that can happen on the deck plate by, you know, very simply telling your sailors, your junior officers, hey, I saw the good work that you did today. I appreciate you. Hey, I see that you're struggling. Write your mother, wear sunscreen. You know, show that empathy to people, show them that they're appreciated, and then stay safe. Ultimately, make them feel comfortable, included, valued at the command. And then the other piece of that, too, beyond the deck plate level, is then making sure that they feel that more broadly with the Navy, that the Navy is looking out for their safety, that the Navy is looking out for them and their holistic well-being. And that's, again, why forums like the Naval Institute are so important, because they give those sailors, those junior officers, those leaders who are mid-grade, a voice in a forum to say the things that they're feeling and then get that perception and that feedback that not only are they contributing in you know, running these technologies and propelling the future force forward from a pure material standpoint, it's also about receiving that empathetic response back, that their opinions matter, and that the change is happening because of their efforts. Thank you. Yes, sir, and this, I, I think everyone knows this is the, the topic that I think if, if it's not the biggest topic other than maybe China on, on all of the service leaders' uh, minds right now, um, it's, it's pretty close to the top and certainly for, for the, the Coast Guard Commandant as well. Um, so I might just maybe talk about a little more specific, just there's the general recruiting challenge that the Coast Guard faces along with all, all the other services, but then even more particular is those who do come into the Coast Guard is trying to convince them enough of the Coast Guard members to pursue a career afloat. And that's something that we're, we're, we have the funds from Congress now to, to build a, uh, a pretty robust fleet, bigger than we've ever had. The problem is that we are having a, a hard time filling the billets, the afloat billets that we currently have, and we're gonna be adding a significant number more in the future. And so how do we get more people to to go willingly to a float billets. And that was actually the subject of, of one of the articles that I wrote, um, Sea Duty Still Want to Do It, because um, what we were talking about, uh, the other cutter COs is all the time, is just how do we get, how, how do we incentivize the next generation of people who they like their connectivity, uh, they, they kind of got used to a, a certain pattern of life, uh, and, and I think family relationships, you know, if you look over the last couple of decades have changed such that deploying for, for half the year uh, makes it very difficult. And that's just not a, um, a prospect that a lot of people um, necessarily want to pursue anymore. So you have to make the rewards worth the, the sacrifice. And so I think buying our way out of it probably isn't going to work. Um, you can increase CPAY, you can give more bonuses, and I think that, that will help. But ultimately, it's going to come down to leadership. And I think it's going to be on the CEOs and on the, the leadership team, the senior enlisted, to to make that experience for the people who are who are on the the cutters or the ships or the or the units so rewarding that it's worth the sacrifices and i think every generation of the sea services has had to do that to a certain extent because it's hard and it's never going to be easy um, it's it's better now than it has been in probably any period in the past but it's still going to be difficult so what can we do to uh, make make it just personally rewarding for the people like, like Andrew was saying, recognizing them, looking them in the eyes, um, making it uh, personally fulfilling in a way that they just, they say, yeah, this is tough, but I can't see myself doing anything else. And I think that's, that's a big challenge for us. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So over to the midshipman. Um, Jack Montgomery, a ROTC midshipman. Um, how would you propose the US and I increase engagement with ROTC units? Because I know there's a big push to engage with midshipmen, but a lot of the US and I events and you know publication that's really to deal with acad ac academy midshipmen. 
And frankly, from the ROTC midshipmen I know from summer crews and the ROTC midshipmen I know in my battalion, very few have any engagement with the US and I whatsoever. And anyone who does, whether it's just reading or even trying to submit to contests, it's practically out of a singular, voluntary, extraordinary uh, effort on their own. So you know, what, what are some ways do you think the US and I could try and reach out to these ROTC, ROTC midshipmen who are going to make up a very large portion of the junior officers in the Navy and the Marine Corps? Can I start with that? And I just want to thank the midshipmen at the Yale University NROTC unit this year who invited me to speak on a couple of panels at their leadership conference. And it was a wonderful, wonderful event. And there were ROTC uh, students from many different units around the country, as well as Coast Guard Academy, Kings Point, and Naval Academy, uh, and even some uh, Air, Air Force uh, ROTC and Cyber Force ROTC uh, cadets in the audience as well. So um, if anyone's listening out there, please you know, keep those invitations coming, because we'll get somebody to come speak to you. Uh, and, and we want to do more of that, absolutely. But yes, over, over to you all for more ideas. I think it's got to be proactive, uh, like I mentioned earlier. I think that the Naval Institute needs to reach out to those units, because uh, I know for the, I know the UW MOI very well, and I've already you know, brought her in kind of into proceedings and, and trying to get her soon-to-be Marine officers involved with proceedings. It may not be writing, but at least reading. Uh, I do the same things with my candidates, but uh, I think the Naval Institute being proactive and getting in there <clears throat> and identifying midshipmen that you know maybe have a, a knack for this or, or can be a liaison with that unit and carry it on throughout uh, you know, and pass that down. Because I know that most of the companies, uh, I believe now, have someone that's associated with the Naval Institute or since you guys are so close, it's easy. Uh, but I think you're right. I think getting out there, again, going back to my liaison, you know, past, I think you got to be there, you got to you got to talk to people, uh, and, and you can have a large impact, because I know that there's some battalions in, in the country that have hundreds of midshipmen uh, and some of our larger military schools, to include Navy and Marine Corps, so I think it's just getting there and, and talking to them. Yeah, it's also about leveraging existing networks, so as an example of, of a connection that not, not necessarily is directly relevant to the Naval Institute, but where I can bring the experiences that I've had here to bear. At Old Dominion University, there's a, a program called WIN, and it's I think it's, it stands for Women in Networking, um, but it leverages first-generation college students and puts them in touch with women mentors in the area who are you know leading out of Huntington Ingalls Industries or you know Newport News Shipbuilding more broadly or any of the entities that are based in Hamptons Roads, Virginia, and. I sought out support from my squadron to have a to create a, a permanent role and a permanent liaison from Squadron 8, the submarine squadron, to ODU Win, so that we can have a sustained relationship with our active duty personnel to that organization. And ODU maybe is not the best example because there's already a lot of active duty military personnel who are there. But it's like LJ was saying, if you have people that are in those geographic areas who can leverage existing networks to be a military presence, to be a thoughtful representative of the Naval Institute in those networks, then that is certainly one way to expand the impact of this awesome organization. If I could hop in real quick. Yeah. I think it, it's also on you to, to share that with your, your fellow classmates, right? And, and as you kind of come up through the ranks to encourage your, your other junior midshipmen to write as well, I can tell you that one of my proudest USNI moment it was not anything I wrote, but it was convincing my then roommate, Captain Mike Fernandez, to write an article about fire support because he was really passionate about it uh, and actually get published in proceedings. That was the, what I was most proud about because I could actually see, hey, this is propagating uh, throughout my network and I'm actually bringing more, more people into the fold so that they can contribute to this awesome forum. So it's, it's equally on you uh, to help push that stuff out and be an active, uh, you know, uh, you know broadcaster for the for the institute but we are out of time this has been a, a wonderful conversation i want to thank commander allen lieutenant howard captain winnefeld uh, for being here today uh, they are all in incredibly busy points in their career uh, bringing a submarine to life recruiting the future of the marine corps getting ready to go to uh, the next amazing assignment for uh, commander allen and, uh, and for writing and for the, the, um, uh, the job you've all done in developing other proceedings authors uh, to write for us as well. I want to thank you. And over to my boss. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> you. 
We thank our panel moderator, Bill Hamlet, Editor-in-Chief for Proceedings. We thank Craig, Andrea, LJ for a terrific discussion. We, I'll admit that we gave a lot of thought to this for this annual meeting because we had to talk about history, but we also needed to talk about what was happening now and in our future. And I dare say that we hit it right tonight because we saw those essay winners. We heard from our panel. We got the history, which was incredible, from Dr. Simons. And uh, I think it all worked. And I'd like to thank Dr. Craig Simons for his awesome remarks. And for each of our panelists and Dr. Simons, we have a copy of uh, Porter Halliburton's book, uh, Reflections on Captivity. And you heard his words, but I really think... Uh, if there's a better adjusted human being on the planet who understands uh, himself and forgiveness, uh, I haven't met that person. So it's worth a read, and I hope you all do that. Um, for those, uh, so let's give our panel one more hand, and Dr. Simon, one more hand. And uh, for those attending the uh, dedication of the proceedings wall, named in honor of Jack London, please join us in the grand foyer after this. And uh, before we head up to the topside terrace for a reception, um, I'd like to thank everybody who made our success possible over all these years. And I do have a call to action. Engage in our forum. Stay informed with our journalistic effort with USNI News. Listen to our Proceedings podcast series. Give a tax-deductible gift to underpin our critical programs. Support our mission through membership if you can, and spread the word. We ask every member to think about recruiting one more member. So thank you again. And before we adjourn, I think it's very important to remember all the sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, airmen and soldiers who are standing watch tonight throughout the globe who are protecting the freedoms that we all enjoy. So may God bless them and may God bless the United States of America. This concludes our 150th annual meeting.